discomfort, tension not feeling prepared, skin color, the clothing that people wear, distance, exhaustion, CNN, news reports, Twitter feeds, cell phones, text messages, email, billboards, magazines, radio campaigns, TV advertisements, conversations, smiles, handshakes, the sparkle in somebody's eye, great weather, an adventure, the unknown, unprepared but totally ready, forgetting what's written here and wanting to know what's written here, learning a new language, laughing when you don't have a clue what to say or you've said the wrong word entirely. There are two very different ways to approach the world. I think we're in one of the scariest and most exciting places in history. Has there ever been a time where you felt like the world was being brought to you more than today? In our smartphones, on our laptops, wherever we are, we feel connected to a world. There's never been more information and more pictures and more access to the entire world. The world is flat, right? And there's also a very scary reality that we think we know everything about everything, yet we have experienced nothing oftentimes. Nothing. We are so incredibly opinionated based on what we see flipping stations or looking at our blog feeds or what we've learned wherever we've been. But if wherever you are, and the rhythm is that it's one or three channels that are telling you what's going on in the Middle East, or if it's one university and one professor that informs you around a certain subject, if you don't have a multitude of counsel in your life, if you don't have a lot of voices in your life and a lot of experiences around a given issue and you become super opinionated based on knowing all of these things and these facts and all, having access to all of this information, but you haven't gone and seen, you haven't experienced, you haven't looked into someone's eyes, you haven't walked with them, you haven't engaged an issue from a heart level as opposed to an informational level, what do you have to say? How frightening would it be if the world was, re was reduced to what comes through your, your handheld? This is a smartphone. And I used to have all the phone numbers in my life memorized when I was in high school. How many do I have memorized now? Maybe five? I don't think I've gotten smarter <laughs> holding on to this thing. I used to know how to read a map to get from place to place. And last month, a buddy and I went, hey, let's try something crazy. We're not actually going to use our maps like our iPhones. Let's see if we can figure out how to use an atlas. How does this thing work? Smartphone, maybe not smartest person if you give your entire life to it. Are you truly informed if all of your information is coming from a channel that has incredible bias and propaganda around it or running it? Do we have any idea what's behind the media? Do we have any idea what the advertising influence is around the news that's being reported to us. I'm in the music industry, and guess what? Perfume companies, um, wa uh, watches, um, and really expensive cars, for the most part, are driving what's heard on the radio or what you'll see in the magazines. So perfume companies, watch manufacturers, and car manufacturers are the determiners of what you're going to hear. Those companies, those people are going to tell me what music to listen to and what to like. That's frightening. That's very frightening. 
I'd like to know what you guys are listening to. My favorite conversation is over coffee. Hey, have you found any new music? Tell me what it is. <clears throat> it's the greatest thing to have a personal story to hand off to someone else, whether it's a great movie or a great song or whatever it is. I don't look to huge corporations and their advertising dollars to figure out what music to listen to. Hollywood is a very interesting influencer. I had my, uh, my world completely rocked uh, in October, it was last year, a year ago. I went to the Middle East for the first time. And I had the opportunity to go with a, a group of faith-based individuals that were on a peacemaking um, and reconciliation trip. And I got to go through uh, Jordan and spent time in Beirut and I spent time in Israel over the course of 10 days, and I cannot tell you, this is funny and this is tragic, I cannot tell you how many times while in our van, a car would go speeding past us and I would have this huge a burst of anxiety because of how many times I've watched in films that when a car goes blowing past you in the Middle East, you're gonna be blown up. I felt in, in my core the fear that watching movies has put into me in a region where I have not met anyone before, in a region where when I walk up to a mom and see a tear in her eye, like I melt when I meet a child, I wanna pick him up and hug him, when I'm playing a song for someone over there and they're wearing something that I'm not used to, but they start to sway or clap or do it, all of the fear melts away. Hollywood made it so hard for me in the first five days of a 10 day trip to fully be present that I had to think about, well, they're just movies, right? They are not just movies. These are not just news feeds. They're not just blogs. They're not just sermons. They're not just lectures. Everything is coming from a bias. Everything has a little bit of propaganda wrapped around it. I have propaganda in me. I have things that are very valuable to me. I have biases that are very important to me that I want to share with you. But the most important thing is Go and see. Go. Go and see. Each one of you, go. Don't take my word for it. If I had taken people's words, if I had read a certain section in a magazine and went, oh, cool, I'm going to try to write a song about that, it would be lifeless. It would be filled with cliche. It would feel like I was trying to create something that would sell. It might look like a TV advertisement where there's a child crying and there's a lot of flies on his face and there's a guy walking with a very somber voice saying, now look at these children. If you'll just sign up for $29 a month, we'll paint smile. Nobody wants to look at that if that's the only thing that you're gonna present. Yes, children cry. They cry in millionaire families and they cry in trash dumps in Nicaragua. Yes, kids smile and laugh. They smile and laugh in millionaires' homes and in trash dumps in Nicaragua. You have to see both. You have to have the full experience of what beauty looks like and what tragedy looks like and feel the commingling of the tension there or else you will not, you will not know and you will not have experienced what is in front of you. If I see enough of those ads about starvation or about poverty where it's dark on dark and sad music and everything else. It's guilt and it's shame and they want my money and they do not want me to come. And if you see that for months or if you see that for years or if there's a whole generation that that's how these stories are captured, all of us see that and go, oh yeah, nope, I don't want anything to do with that. If I'm feeling any sort of guilt, I'll just make a quick check and make it go away. I don't even want to see that. That is such a tragedy. The opposite is go and find the most beautiful laughter in a place where you would assume it couldn't exist. Go ahead, turn this on. Good. Ready to go. Okay. So that is, that's Ileana in the center, and that smile wrecked me in a trash dump in Nicaragua. Wrecked me not speaking Spanish, being inside a taxi, and not being willing to get out. I was in a taxi cab 10 consecutive trips going into this particular community, this little slum village in a trash dump. Would not get out of the car, scared to death, 
all of the fear in the world. What will I do? I know about poverty. These people are going to jump me. I'm going to lose my wallet. I may lose my life. I may lose everything. And this is the reality of what poverty looks like in the center of a trash dump. In Nicaragua, when I asked my Nicaraguan friends, so what's your, what's your feeling about La Chureca, the name of this place? They go, oh, it's the most dangerous place in all of Managua. You should never go. And I'm like, really? Can I show you some pictures? And I would show them pictures. And this is 10 minutes, 15 minutes from where they live. And they would go, oh, there are kids there? Oh, they're laughing. Oh my gosh, by the end of five or 10 slides, Managuans that live there were going, well, maybe, maybe we're wrong. There is such propaganda. The least safe place in Managua, which could be the least safe place in all of Central America, I have been 50 or 60 times. One time, one time have I encountered something that could have turned into a bit of a conflict. One time. I have friends that have been into Central America two or three times, and they've gotten mugged in taxis, and they've gone to really expensive hotels, and they've walked out, and they've been you know, raw. I am telling you, this is the scariest place in all of Managua, and I have not one time seen anything that could have been life-threatening. Just one time where there was a little bit of tension. So this is the face of what, what beauty and what laughter looks like in the heart of a place that otherwise is so dark. Does this advance? Well, if that's the one photo we have, that's a good one to focus on. Um, the second story that I'd like to share with you is uh, I was going to Zimbabwe in 2007 because I was a part of a benefit concert called Dispatch Zimbabwe. And uh, we played at Madison Square Garden, intending to play one night, and we sold out the second night, and we sold out the third night. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, we haven't played in three years, and we're going to be talking about a country where uh, I haven't been. That feels really awkward to me. 60,000 people over the course of three nights. And we have great photos. And we've learned a lot. And we've sung a song called Alias, which is written in Shona. And there's a personal story about that song. But I think I have to know it. I'm not going to feel comfortable standing on stage and talking about a place that I haven't been. So I jump online and pull up you know, everything that I can about Zimbabwe and red flag, red flag, red flag. I think one of the governmental uh, kind of reviews of Zimbabwe said, <coughs> This is a country where we will not come in. If something goes wrong on your travel, you're more or less on your own. You know, the, every possible embargo surrounds Zimbabwe. You, you know, this is a place you do not go. It's incredibly unsafe. It's the poorest country in the world. They painted the bleakest picture you can imagine to the point that my friends, t three of us went, we're in Johannesburg. We have flown 18 hours. We're so exhausted and we're thinking to ourselves like, are we going to die when we fly and land in Zimbabwe? <coughs> Sounds like the military is everywhere. Sounds like corrupt police are everywhere. Are we really going to do this? I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's worth it. So we spent time talking to each other. And I got on the phone and called, you know, I called my parents and talked to them a little bit. And I started texting and emailing friends going, I'm really like, I don't know what's going to happen when I go <laughs> on the other side here. Are we going to get kidnapped? What's going to happen? So we decide, no, we really do need to go. And we land, and we get off the plane. And there's a guy holding a, a poster, like a joking poster of me playing in a concert. And it says Bradigan underneath it. And he's kind of like smiling, going, are you this guy? And I'm like, yes. You know, My heart is racing, thinking that I'm going to go through a military checkpoint. And instead, I arrive to a smile, holding a poster that's a joke. And then we drive, and it's absolutely gorgeous unbelievable countryside. The people are so welcoming and generous. Yes, it is the poorest country in the world. And the politics and the propaganda surrounding that country, uh, another tragedy. Four days in Zimbabwe, and I came back to the United States ready to speak to one person or 100 million people. I could have spoken to a youth group of six. I could have spoken on the Tonight Show, with the same passion saying, we must go. You have to go. The greatest thing that could happen if we were in a place where politics 
and power and dollars and advertising weren't the key influencers influencing the media, influencing us, if it could just be a different way, what is happening in Zimbabwe still today because of the political situation and the gap between the dictator and his wealth and the people in their poverty, all of us should go. Every single one of us should go. There's no freedom of press in Zimbabwe, but there's freedom to travel. And you have eyes. And wherever I went, I could tell that people were watching and acting a little bit more um, cautious. Like I could tell where the corruption was in a given area, and I could tell where the people were that were underneath this uh, kind of regime of corruption. But when I walk in as a Westerner and someone with a camera, I could tell that things were mellowing a little bit. What if there were thousands of us that went to Zimbabwe? What if there were tens of thousands of us that went just to be a physical presence? The people feel so upheld, encouraged, served, because we had the courage to go. And those who are trying to perpetrate all kinds of evils don't quite feel like they have as many shadows to stand in. Because wherever I go, I, I'm, I'm like a light. You are like lights. That is. That is as clear a picture as I can give you. Zimbabwe, if you go, you're on your own. There is nothing in our governmental policy where we can come and help you. You are on your own. I get there, and those people are on their own. And we need to be there. In Nicaragua, that is the reality of what it looks like. But the smiles, the smiles, that's what you keep. That's what you carry with you wherever you go. One last little uh, idea. Everything that our country sells is not as it looks like. What we aspire to, the people that we want to be, the wealth that we're supposed to have, the influence and the fame, I've, I've met a lot of people that are in those circles. I don't find the majority of them smiling. I find that the majority of them have found a place that they were never supposed to find. Go and see. Find out if your dreams are where they should be. Go and see. Find out if the fears that are in front of you are just uh, walls of propaganda holding you back. Go and see. Oh.